Venture Brothers is the most slept on show that Adult Swim has ever made. I'm constantly telling comic fans that they're completely overlooking this underappreciated gem of a show. Remember when this channel used to be about superheroes? Well, it's funny you mention that, because despite the fact that the show doesn't revolve around superheroes specifically, it still manages to be one of the best superhero shows on TV. Let me explain. While Venture Brothers starts off as a shoddily animated Johnny Quest parody, it eventually grows into a world of its own around the second season. The world of Venture Brothers is basically the world of the classic Hanna-Barbera cartoons, mixed with a blend of the DC and Marvel universes, with a touch of G.I. Joe thrown in for good measure. There are mad scientists, supervillains, superheroes, super secret spy organizations, meddling middle-aged burnouts, and even more. The show focuses on the mysteries and bizarre adventures that the Venture family gets into. Even though the show is titled Venture Brothers, it rarely focuses on them after the first season. And it's not until around season 3 or 4 that we finally start to see their characters develop. Mostly because they're club. Because you're club. Club. I can't help feeling like we're just not getting the whole story here, you know? Right? A lot of the episodes actually revolve around Hank and Dean's dad, Rusty Venture. I thought you were used to this. Dean, I remember when the action man would wake me up with a gun pointed at my head. He'd just hold it there and pull the trigger. I'd hear the click really loud because it was right against my forehead. It sounded like he snapped one of my teeth out. Click! Then he'd go, not today, Rusty. Not today. Holly! I took it because I was Rusty Venture. I didn't ask for this life, Dean. But it's mine. Rusty is the son of one of the world's greatest heroes, Jonas Venture. Rusty spent his childhood as his dad's sidekick, going on adventures with the original Team Venture. Go Team Venture! But after his father's untimely demise, Rusty was never able to live up to the Venture family name. Now Rusty lives in the shadow of his father, struggling to maintain the once prestigious Venture Industries, a company that's now a shell of what it once was. And because Rusty isn't the best super scientist, he relies on contracting others and repurposing his father's older inventions for newfound commercial applications. We're in a shit storm of trouble, Dr. Venture! Been taking still in the red from the Gargantia 2 fiesta! And we spent a fortune getting this here skyscraper seaworthy after your pappy Shanghai. So whatever ye and your junior science club have been cooking up down in Spexi, you better produce some measurable results right quick, or Ventex gonna go belly up! <clears throat> well, gentlemen, there's only one thing left to do. What are you doing there, Doc? Jeez, Doc! In the quest to make sure Venture Industries doesn't go bankrupt, Rusty goes on adventures to salvage his father's old tech with his two sons, Hank and Dean, as well as the team's gruff, badass bodyguard, Brock motherfucking Samson. Oh yeah, and then they also have this really cool robot named Helper. Of course, you would be the person to lack consideration for the artificially enable SMH. That's beautiful, Helper. What was that, Shell Silverstein? Well, I don't think Maya Angelou was talking about this chick. She's as deadly as they come, and if she hurts those boys again, I'm gonna take her down permanently this time. Oh, not Maya Angelou. The show's first few seasons feature the cast getting into adventures that are eerily similar to the adventures that Rusty went on as a kid. Go for the bastard's neck. Keep him up there, Kano. I don't care if he wets himself and your head. That boy is gonna see somebody die. And if he doesn't want it to be his father, he's got to pull that trigger. With many of these episodes using flashbacks to those previous off-screen adventures as stepping stones to build the lore of the show. Like the episode Spanakopita. When Rusty was a kid, he got kidnapped while the original Team Venture were off on a mission. But the kidnappers felt so sorry for him that they threw a made-up festival just to cheer him up. Spanakopita! And for years since, Rusty visited the island every summer to attend the made-up festival. Now everyone on the island is in on the scam, but they make so much money off of Rusty that they just play along anyway. And the festival just makes Rusty so happy that everyone on Team Venture plays along too. Also that Rusty can have this one small bit of joy in his otherwise miserable life. Because every waking moment of Rusty's life, he's reminded of his father. He lives in a compound surrounded by mementos of Team Venture's greatest victories. Mementos that all serve as reminders of his own traumatic childhood and his failure to live up to the Venture family name. Legacy and failure are recurring themes in Venture Brothers. 
As neglectful and careless of a father as Rusty is to Dean and Hank, Rusty's own father Jonas was much worse. There are tons of flashbacks showcasing the violent traumatic childhood that made Rusty the neglective, cynical asshole that he is today. But, but I, I thought you said the world, world views Rusty's, Rusty's dad as one of the world's, the world's greatest, greatest heroes. heroes. They do, but the same can't be said of Rusty. While the world was hearing war stories of Doc Venture saving the world, Rusty's own childhood was a living hell. Living through that trauma over and over and over again on daily adventures, constantly witnessing his own father's cruelty and carelessness, what the world viewed as wonder, Rusty experienced as horror. Who from the ages of 3 to 17 accompanied him on hundreds of adventures, the chilling memories of which rouse him from sleep in a cold sweat to this day. As the show went on, we would come to realize that Rusty Venture had a childhood that was much more similar to Morty than Johnny Quest. I'm just turning 16 and having a birthday pool party. My father invites every girl he knows. And I'm not talking about girls my age. No, not Jonas. He invites playboy bunnies and models and I think actual whores, you know, real prostitutes. So there I am in my giant bathing suit and I hear, and now the man of the hour, Rusty Venture. All eyes on me, right? Then suddenly, Almost predictably, the action man shoots my groin with a shrink ray right as that f***ing jackass colonel gentleman pulls my shorts down. Well, it's like a nightmare. Oh no, no! What I went through today was like a nightmare. What happened when I was 16? That is my life. Rusty still lives with Jonas's failure to be a father, and through that he fails his own children as well. Having never had a close relationship with his own father, Rusty doesn't know how to be one to Hank and Dean. Rusty is just the burnout son who could never live up to his father's namesake. He's the Dale Earnhardt Jr. of the Venture Brothers universe, stuck in the shadow of his father, knowing he could never live up to the memory of a man who never existed in the first place. A man remembered in an ideal light, while history forgot his most unspeakable sins. Sins that Rusty still lives with and has to deal with every day. Forget it, I'm not my dad. I can't even fix something that he invented. I was a good boy adventurer, but I suck at this. You, this, this is, is getting kind of heavy. I thought, I thought this, this was, was a, a comedy, comedy show. show. Weren't, Weren't there, there some, some other characters, characters like, like a dude who's totally, totally not a Doctor, Doctor Strange ripoff, off, and, and a legion of evil supervillains or something? Great transition, Six. As the show evolved, so did its cast of characters, with characters like Dr. Orpheus and the Order of the Triad being introduced, as well as expanding the lore with organizations like the OSI, the Guild of Calamitous Intent, and Sphinx being introduced. Sphinx! And with that came a growing cast of heroes and villains, giving later seasons of the show a more of Justice League Unlimited vibe, with there being more and more episodes based on the villains and side characters as time went on. With the growing cast of characters, the show broke out of its format, and the characters got to evolve from two-dimensional parodies of comic book and action cartoon cliches into their own unique entities. My old man. Yes, your father was- Whoa! Don't you talk about my father! Ow! It all starts to come together in the season one episode, Trial of the Monarch. This is the first episode of the series where the Venture family takes a back seat. Instead, it focuses on fleshing out side characters like the Monarch, Doctor Girlfriend, and Phantom Limb, as well as establishing guild law and the rules regarding villainy in the Venture Brothers universe. This is the episode where the show outgrows its tropes and really starts to become its own thing, with all the side characters featured here becoming more and more prominent as the show went on. Perhaps none more so than the Mighty Monarch. As the show developed, Monarch became more than just a foil to Rusty, as we learned that Rusty and Monarch are more similar than different. Perhaps more so than either of them realize. That sounds like foreshadowing. Six, if you keep up that filthy language, Mother Susan will demonetize the video. Well, we're not even close to the climax yet. Doc Venture's nemesis, the Mighty Monarch, began to get his own fair share of development around the second season sometimes even serving as a secondary protagonist, with entire episodes and season subplots centered around him and his henchmen. One of the Monarch's henchmen, 21, actually has some of the best character development out of anyone in the series, going through a series of tragedies that transforms him from a neck-bearded fanboy into the Monarch's most valuable henchman. And the development of the Monarch and Dr. Girlfriend's relationship serves as one of the series' most compelling plot threads, with the pair splitting up and then making amends in a realistic way that serves to grow and develop both characters characters. That subplot made it so that the Monarch was more than its hate for Venture. A deep hate for Dr. Venture. Why? Because the 
Monarch has passion. He has more hate in his yellow glove than most villains have in their whole costume. What does he hate, Dr. Venture? Because he can't fake it. He would rather jeopardize his whole career than art somebody else. That's why, because he's the real thing. Now, Mom, what did Dr. Venture do to the Monarch to make them enemies? Uh, nothing worth destroying a career, a marriage. And it developed Dr. Girlfriend so that she was more than just Dr. Girlfriend. I used to be Lady Opair. Giving her a sense of independence and autonomy that let her grow into one of the best characters on the show. With Dr. Mrs. the Monarch even becoming a council member of the Guild of Calamitous Intent, outranking her husband's own authority within the Guild. A plot development that created more strife between the pair, with the Monarch trying to take advantage of her position of authority within the League, while Dr. Girlfriend tries to further her own career, as the Monarch continually drags her down both emotionally and professionally. If I went any further, I'd be spoiling some of the best plot points in the show, so I've really just gotta urge you to go watch the show yourself. Now there are some serious spoilers for the Venture Brothers after this point, so if you're not all caught up, go ahead and skip ahead to the timestamp on screen. You've been, been warned. warned. Despite what the first season might have you believe, The Venture Brothers isn't actually about Hank and Dean Venture, but it is still about a pair of Venture Brothers. In Season 7, it's revealed that Rusty and the Monarch are related by blood, meaning that Rusty and the Monarch have been the titular Venture Brothers the whole time, which is fitting given the Monarch's rising prominence over the course of the series. The Monarch's arc in the back end of the series revolve around rebuilding his career after he loses his cocoon and henchmen at the end of Season 5. To parallel the Monarch's fall from grace, Rusty inherits a new fortune and a new company from his dead brother, putting Monarch at the lowest point in his career while Rusty is at his peak. Rusty's new level of infamy makes him the number one target for every top level arch in the guild, and because of the Monarch's new reduced guild status, he can't even arch the man he went into arching to arch in the first place, turning what was once a passionate career into just another meaningless, dead-end job. This sets the Monarch on an unintentional journey of self-discovery, after he moves into his childhood home and finds a hidden superhero secret lair in his basement. Your dad was the Blue Morpho! Please. My father was a boozed up socialite who collected butterflies in his copious spare time. No way he could have been a... Together with Henchman 21, the Monarch takes up the mantle of the Blue Morpho in order to take out Rusty's arches one by one until the Monarch is the only one left to take on Dr. Venture. I just love the backwards logic of the Monarch finding a way to cheat his way to the top rather than working his way back up the ladder through the traditional route something that he's already done once before and clearly isn't interested in doing again. The Monarch taking that underhanded route to success is totally in character and serves how petty he is. The Monarch is exactly the type of guy to make more work for himself by taking a shortcut instead of just doing something the right way the first time. But that pettiness and cold crest attitude towards the world is just one of many things that Rusty and the Monarch have in common. Another common element they share is family. Going back to what I said earlier, one of the key focuses of Venture Brothers is Legacy, and the role that Legacy plays in the lives of these characters. Rusty has the boys, Brock, and Hatred, and the Monarch has his wife in 21. It's the relationships between these families that makes up the foundations of the Venture Brothers universe. It's a world built on Legacy, so it's only fitting that their shared lineage is also the reason for the strife between them. Ah, join me! Are you kidding? It's freezing. Do this alone, you jackass. You are never there for me! The Monarch's father, the original Blue Morpho, worked alongside Rusty's father, and whenever Jonas needed someone to do the dirty work that he couldn't handle publicly, he called the Blue Morpho. Well, I mean, he didn't just call him, he also kind of blackmailed him into being his own personal henchman too. But despite all that, they still managed to be friends. And when the Blue Morpho found himself unable to father a child, he turned to his friend Jonas for help. It's almost never the first. Science is doing wonderful things with fertility these days. Say, you should have the little woman swing by my compound for a better examination. You think you can help her? Oh, I, oh, I know I can. Can, can. My science is quite potent. Bad friend. But what the Blue Morpho didn't know is that Jonas would end up seducing his wife and knocking her up himself. But that wouldn't be the last tragedy that Blue Morpho suffered. Not even close to it, because only a few years later, the Blue Morpho's entire family was involved in a deadly plane crash, where only his son survived. At least, at first, anyway. 
Jonas took what was left of the blue Morpho's body and turned him into Venturian. A sickening abomination that wasn't quite man and wasn't quite machine. And before long, something in Venturian's brain just went haywire, and he attacked Rusty for seemingly no reason. And after that, the Blue Morpho's former sidekick, Kano, had to put him down. Only for the remains of Venturian to be found later by members of the Guild of Calamus and Tent, who reprogrammed him and turned him into one of their own, turning him from Venturian into Vendetta. The Blue Morpho's son, the Monarch, ended up surviving the plane crash and lived among a group of butterflies for a brief time after it. And that brief stint with the butterflies impacted him so greatly that it shaped the supervillain he would one day become. The entirety of the Venture Brothers culminates to tell this story in a three-part episode at the start of the seventh season called the Morphic Trilogy. It's here that the original Blue Morpho regains his memories, and it's realized that Jonas Venture is actually more alive than dead. These are the three episodes that escalate and escalate and escalate to a crescendo of madness. Because despite the conflict between Jonas and the Blue Morpho being so prominent in shaping the Venture family legacy, everyone involved is completely blind to it. All this history culminating in front of them, and they're so wrapped up in their own bullshit that they can't put it all together and appreciate what's right in front of them. It takes the original Team Venture explaining what's going on for either Rusty or Monarch to finally grasp the seriousness of the situation. So when the conflict comes to a head with Jonas attacking the Blue Morpho, it's only fitting that Monarch and Rusty get dragged into the fray as well. Two self-centered men, completely blind to the legacy in front of them. Two brothers, so caught up in their own petty bullshit that they can't possibly realize the story that's unfolding right in front of their eyes or how it relates to them and their entire families. All because they've forgotten their own legacy outside of how it relates to them directly. All of the clues that we the audience are completely aware of, Rusty and the Monarch are completely blind to. And even after all of this, Rusty and the Monarch still have no idea that they're related until they're explicitly told at the end of the season, and what I guess is the end of the series now. And despite the fact that these two characters couldn't have more in common, they're always at each other's throats throughout the whole series, continuing the war of their fathers before them for seemingly no reason. Oh, Time Team Venture rescued me. Hey, nobody came to rescue you. Like, nobody even answered my ransom calls. Well, maybe if you hold me longer. I, I, I'm sure somebody's working out a rescue plan. Forget it, we lose. We're wash-ups. Losers. So, my old number two will be my boss. That's nothing. My new bodyguard is my old arch enemy. <laughs> yeah, that's messed up. Hi, well, <laughs> guess you should just go home. Can you even call it a home? It's just a box full of memories. All right. Um, can I get a ride? No, nah, no, nah, I can't. I gotta tell the wife you escaped, and I understand. Yeah, no. So, uh, should I just... Yeah, let yourself out. Uh, break a couple things. Make it look good. God, I like being tortured more than this here. This is... Ugh. Bureaucratic nonsense and circumstance are the only things that separate Rusty from the Monarch. At least morally, they're about the same. Hundreds of henchmen have died in the Monarch's name in order to fuck over Venture, and countless others have died in service of the Venture family escapades or Venture inventions with the morality behind some of those decisions being more than questionable. What the hell is this thing made out of? Nothing. Come on. All right, fine. I might have used a few unorthodox parts. Just tell me one. An orphan. A what? <clears throat> an orphan? Did you say an orphan? Yeah, a little orphan boy. It's powered by a forsaken child! Might be, kind of. I mean, I didn't use the whole thing. Like I've said before, in the Venture Brothers, good and evil are political ideologies, not systems of morality. So that puts the Monarch and Rusty on a pretty even playing field. Two selfish bastards that ignore the needs of those around them in favor of their own selfish desires. Making them both fitting heirs to the Venture family legacy. Unfortunately, Venture Brothers was cancelled back in fall 2020. But despite this, both the creators of the show and Adult Swim have advocated for its return. And I think that'll probably come in the form of a one hour series finale, sort of like Operation Prom or all that in Gargantua 2. 
But there are rumors that Doc and Jack are working on a Venture Brothers spinoff. And there are also rumors that Ben Edlin is making a new tick show. And Ben Edlin is one of the few people other than Jack or Doc to ever write for the Venture Brothers. So I think it's pretty likely that we could see a tick series set in the Venture Brothers universe. But that's just my little fan theory for now. And maybe it has something to do with the spec script fanfic that I'm writing. P.S. Doc, Jack, Ben. If you're out there watching or listening and you want to check out that fanfic, you know, have your helper call my helper. But with all that said, I'm going to wrap things up. Venture Brothers is one of my all-time favorite shows, right next to Twin Peaks and Community. It's like comfort food. It's a cozy little show that I can rewatch over and over and over again. And it just breaks my heart to see it gone. So if you haven't seen it yet, I highly encourage you to go check it out. The more people who do, the more likely it is that Jack and Doc will get to write a proper series finale for it. Now, there's a lot of stuff I had to leave out of the video, so if you'd like to see another video that focuses on the production side of things and the show's creators, Doc Hammer and Jackson Public, then let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate it if you dropped a like and subscribe to the channel. According to my YouTube statistics, most of the people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So if you like the video, consider subscribing. It's free, only takes a second, and you can always unsubscribe if you don't like the next video. And I also have a Patreon where I post early drafts of videos, so if you'd like to see even more Super Swim Team 7 content in the future, supporting me on Patreon is the best way to make sure that happens. Maybe one day I'll be able to do this full time and upload weekly. That's definitely the end goal, but it's not quite possible yet. And I also have a Twitter where I shitpost about comics and cartoons way too often. And I also have an Instagram where I shitpost about comics and cartoons way too often. And a Discord where I ship po- uh, you, you get it. You get it at this point. I'm just rambling. Check out the bio link in the description to check all those out. I'd really appreciate it if you did. But with all that being said, I've been Swim Team Captain 7. I've, I've been, been Swim, Swim Team, Team Chronicle, Chronicle 6. 6. And I've been feeling kind of funny, to be honest. And this has been Super Swim Team 7. Signing off.